Good morning. Can I please request everyone to take their seats? We will not now start with the conference. of Adri. Yesterday's discussion saw enthralling topics being covered by various scholars, the feminism of agriculture, regional governance and resilience in India, Bihar as a model for Nepal, the prelude to Baksa, 1764. We also revisited the Bihar-West Bengal merger plan and the earliest document lo documented locations of Hindi literature. We had six different technical sessions with presentations from over 25 scholars. We start today's conference with a lecture delivered by Kaushik Ghosh, Professor, University of Texas, Austin, and chaired by Janine Roger, Senior Visiting Fellow, Institute for Human Development. The topic for this lecture is The Shimmering Land, Adivasiness, and the Ecological Imperative. Can I please request the chairperson to take over the proceedings? Good morning, everybody. I'm sure that the room will be filled in as we go, because <laughs> it's very early. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Koshik Ghosh. He's an anthropologist, trained at Princeton University, and is currently a professor at the University of Texas, Austin. His interests focus on the connections between culture, politics, and ecology and he has conducted long-term historical and ethnographic research on Adivasi struggles against displacement. And the title of his lecture today is The Shimmering Land, Adivasiness, and the Ecological Imperative. The floor is yours. Thank Thank you, everybody. Morning, and uh, it's great to see that some of you are brave enough to have made this. Uh, this is not my usual time of performing, um, but thanks. And thanks, Janine. And uh, I also wanted to let you know that there's going to be, it's, it's very little visual, actually. Um, it, it promises as if there's a lot to come after this, but it's not a PowerPoint presentation, so can, do you hear me properly? Uh, yeah, it's clear, because I'm going to read out some stuff. Um, okay, so this is, this is a photo, which is, some of you who work in Adivasi area may know what it is. Um, it's a Sasandiri, uh, the burial stones uh, in Amunda village. It's uh, because it is about, a lot of the talk is about land and um, this is a very important place where the Adivasi conversation on land differs from a lot else in South Asia and, and in many parts of the world. So without further ado, let me start um, to present the paper. Uh, historian Prathama Banerjee, in a poignant review of a possible field of Adivasi studies, has mentioned that there is a crucial difference 
between what defines the political for Dalits and what defines the political for Adivasis. To put it simply, Banerjee writes, the Dalit articulation of democracy in 20th century India has been through the question of representation, while the Adivasi articulation of democracy has been through the question of autonomy. Unfortunately, however, as Banerjee points out, there has been very little reflection on what such autonomy might mean in a theory of democracy. Further elaborating on what the question of autonomy entails, she writes, I quote, the tribal demand for autonomy brings to the fore the land question. Land in the Adivasi case has to necessarily go beyond the notion of land as property, both in the liberal Lockean sense and in the more radical sense, radical in the sense of land to the tiller. In fact, Banerjee suggests one would argue, drawing from Adivasi histories, that the very concept of land must be reimagined as ecology rather than land per se, that is, as inclusive of forest, field, minerals, water, and animals on the one hand, and of specific modes of habitation and relation of peoples with such land on the other. The latter would include cultural, symbolic, and indeed spiritual investments that diverse peoples make in their lands and landscapes. As importantly, it would include not only the question of using and inhabiting land in particular ways, but also diverse modes of traversing, traversing land as it were. Thus, especially with regard to tribes and pastoralists, the issues of free and unfree migration, mobile cultivation such as Jhum, crossing of borders, return and loss importantly constitute the land question as simultaneously a territorial question. While these have become fairly well-developed themes in the writings on indigeneity, land and the futures of democracy in Australia or Latin America and in worldwide indigenous politics itself, it is true that the challenge of adivasiness and its autonomy in the context of our democratic imagination are yet to be seriously explored. It is with this challenge in mind that I have tried to think through a couple of aspects of Adivasi practices of inhabitation of land. This could be called the Adivasi ecological imperative, but it necessarily takes us beyond some of the conventional analysis in which ecology is understood in both the sciences and the social sciences. Let me then get closer and into some details of what this may entail. My friend James's daughter, Sunita, lives in Delhi. Like the thousands of Adivasi young women who have moved in to do care work in domestic spaces of the new affluent enclaves of Indian cities, Sunita works as a maid in a wealthy household in Hoskas. Unlike many of them, however, Sunita has largely been happy with her job and her employers. They trust me and have been very generous to me, she told me brightly when I first went to see her in Delhi. But what ails Sunita is a recurrent illness. She wakes up cold and shivering and then realizes that she cannot get up. Her body feels heavy like a stone, virtually immobile. Her father, James's sensitive face, trembled a little as he told me this about his daughter. James and I were walking early in the morning towards the Karo River near James's house, some 1,200 long kilometers away from Delhi. We were up early that day because James was in a hurry. He had to get things ready before sitting down in the Ading, innermost room of a Munda house, to appease some unknown ancestral spirit or haprom bonga. This bonga has to be appeased, James explained. Sunita has unknowingly offended him or her. We do not know how. But without the prayers and without feeding them, Sunita will not get better. It happens at least two to three times a year. Sunita's employers have taken her to several doctors. Tests have been done, but nothing shows up. 
What's certain though is that when afflicted, days will pass with her in that horrible state unless the haprom is propitiated inside her ancestral home deep in a forest village in central India. One usually does not know what the affront or mistake was, but one certainly knows how to appease the bonga. What is most remarkable here is that although the Hapram Bonga's place of residence is the Ading, the innermost room, in a remote ancestral home, the Bongas have the power to affect Adivasi individuals across large distances. The human vulnerability to something seemingly so local and located as the Bonga is operational even when they are physically not in the same place. The place of home and the space of migrant work do not necessarily pose an opposition when looked at from the vulnerability of the humans to the sovereign force of the Bonga earth beings. The next section is called Rootedness and Migration. The archives of the migratory and of the sedentary have generally been treated as separate, if not opposed ones. For Adivasis, migration has certainly been integral to their traditions and histories. From the end of the 18th century, Adivasis, both men and women, sorry. Adivasis, both men and women, have been one of the main populations of migrant laborers who have enabled the consolidation of newer cycles of cap capitalist accumulation. From the early years of post-slavery world of sugar plantations to India's vast tea plantations in the Northeast, from indigo factories to seasonal harvesting across India, from forest clearing, mining, and construction work, ranging from the establishment of the Konkan railways to the laying of 21st century underground digital data cables, Adivasi migrant labor has been crucial in the generation of successive phases of accumulation in South Asia. The zone of gendered domestic work in the urban enclaves of a new India marks the continuation of this Adivasi migration pattern into the contemporary regimes of affective labor. So on the one hand, to invoke Adivasiness in India is to invoke this very prominent aspect of being migratory as an inalienable condition of being and becoming Adivasi in the world. On the other hand, this migratory tradition becomes particularly salient and challenging since Adivasis over this same 200, 250 year period have almost been synonymous with struggles against displacement from their lands. Such struggles, currently more visible and intensified, have persistently underlined the Adivasi demand for collective control over and remaining in place on their ancestral lands. Jharkhand's Adivasi populations, sorry, Jharkhand's Adivasi populations have been at the forefront of these land struggles. But this is true of most Adivasi areas. Quite apart from a mechanically modernist, colonial but nationalist, racial mapping of Adivasi bodies as essentially fixed in place, Adivasi struggles in defense of their lands have indicated a continuing active inhabitation of place. Not the old museum like idea Adivasi live here, but it's an active inhabitation of place. It involves complex forms of attachment and belonging where more than the kind of sovereignty expressed in statehood movements, a continued capacity to attend to the land, a capacity to remain attuned to it, is what becomes the central political question. This is why financial compensation or promises of jobs and alternative settlements have not been able to cancel out or annul the demand for the rights to remain responsible to the dense world of land and territory. I'm going to play a clip 
What we are dealing with here, therefore, is a form of living that is actively and simultaneously, actively and simultaneously rooted and migratory. While historians of labor and labor activists, not to mention the rather limited works of planners and political economists, have emphasized the migratory aspect and called into question imaginations that want to focus on Adivasi connectedness to their lands, the world of indigenous rights, activism, and associated scholarship, and environmentalists have remained either silent about the migratory or even seen it as an overwhelming threat to Adivasi identity and survival. In such a state of affairs, we ignored the possibility that these two elements, the migratory and the rooted, far from being oppositional, may actually illuminate aspects of each other which may have gotten lost in the somewhat mechanical imagination of place and movement. A variety of commentators, including the well-known um, anthropologist, uh, historian of anthropologist James Clifford, have problematized the habitual binary of migration and rootedness that frequently comes into play in the question of indigeneity. Roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, Roots, and Roots, R-O-O-T-S, Clifford has convincingly argued, are both authentically part of the indigenous experience, both in survival and as newer emergences. <laughs> While the recognition of both these aspects as integral to the indigenous experience is crucial, I feel it stops almost exactly where it needs to start. For if Adivasi experience of surviving and living with modernity necessarily questions and trips up the binary of mobility and rootedness, there must be something about the very trajectory and travel of Adivasis that shows, up, shows us how they are connected and how they relate to each other. This will necessitate a departure from the, from the terrain of the plainly historical, where migration and rootedness are ontologically closed questions, as if we understand what one, how one migrates or stays attached to a place. Especially, it seems to me, for an Adivasi, to migrate does not exhaust the practice of staying attuned or vulnerable to place, especially to one's ancestral lands. In fact, the equally extensive aspects of migration and refusal of displacement in Jharkhand's Adivasi lives points to the need to explore how, if at all, the migrant's body can continue to assume this attunement to ancestral land, even while physically at a distance from it. Such an ontological and everyday capacity to be vulnerable to land itself, even in migration, may indicate a significantly different sense of how bodies and places are articulated thus demanding of us a new idiom, not only of Adivasiness and indigeneity, but of environment and ecology themselves. The next section is called Bongas and the Effect of Land. The Bonga world is spatially and taxonomically dense and complex. Those of you who are anthropologists and work in Adivasi areas are quite familiar. Not only are there the ancestral ones who you worship in the house, but the entire Munda landscape is an unfolding map of different classes of Bongas who are both specifically emplaced and yet highly capable of affecting the human body at very distant points. Every element of the landscape, fields and uplands, ponds and lakes, groves and rocks, streams and hills, is the sovereign domain of these non-human earthly beings. The Mundas are consistently vulnerable and obligated to these sovereigns without being subjected to them or even being in physical proximity. A stomach ache, 
a rustle of leaves, a faint shadow of a passing form, a muffled cough at the edge of your courtier late in the summer afternoon. All such sensory fragments are indexical visitations of the human by this world of Gongas. The landscape of the Munda world is thus a deeply affective one, with a continuous demand being put on the humans to be alert and attuning to the various rhythms, flows, and tremulous potentialities of bonga actions on them. And although we are talking about the bongas here, there are many other forces that constitute the land, humans, objects, animals, and other non-humans, whose partial sovereignty has to be similarly acknowledged and submitted to. Unlike the givenness and solid stability that secular visions of landscape portray for us, whether as art, activism, nature, capitalism, resource, Unlike all these, an intense attachment to land is generated here through the human vulnerability, the vulnerability to the fluid movements of bongas producing what I call a shimmering landscape. In this form of place, the migratory and the sedentary cease to work as opposition. The act of bonga worship is an act of submission. It is an acceptance of a different kind of sovereignty. It is an attunement and acceptance of one's vulnerability to another. But it is precisely through that submission and capacity for responsibility that one, I'm not doing very well with this reading out from the computer. Uh, sorry. But it is precisely through the submission and capacity for responsibility that one develops the right to worship. In their vulnerability and attending to the multiple sovereignties of the shimmering landscape, Munda Adivasis thus develop a deep sense of right to the inhabitation of their lands. It is in recognizing land as the domain of this crisscrossing of the authority of heterogeneous bongas and other sovereigns, a space of multiple sovereignties, that we can begin to sense how a complex political theology becomes integral to the very formation of a broader ecology. James Clifford again suggests something analogous about mobility and attachment to place without exploring how such an attachment works out materially and ontologically. I quote from him, uh, Clifford writing, we necessarily turn our attention to indigenous dynamism, interaction, dwelling, in travel. But it is equally important to remember that being native in a more than local sense does not mean sacrificing attachments to a place or places the grounding that helps one feel at home in a world of complex interdependencies. Black Elk, the famous uh, Sioux visionary, somehow took Harney Peak along with uh, when he went to Paris. He's talking about a famous uh, Native American chief, uh, well, more like a visionary, who go while going to Paris felt like he's still attached to the peak. Uh, the sacred peak that is there, and he can still speak to it. However, I suspect that what we may need to pause here, that we may need to pause here before engaging in that last bit of talking about the land with oneself. Along that line of thought, that land coming with you, lies the entire problematic of starting with the individual and assigning of identities taken as some kind of a genotype. In such a version, we'll have the world already finished and coded, wherein we can then safely return the questions of Harney Peaks, ancestral lands, bongas, in the realm of beliefs, indigenous mythology, and all that. But that is not what we want or Clifford wants. After all, in our case, Sunita does not somehow take her ancestral land with her, but rather, through specific acts of the bongas, the land has a way of making her remain responsive and attuned to it. 
she retains the capacity to be responsible and affect and she's uh, and she's affected by a, by through a degree of vulnerability to the bonus land thus emerges away from being an entity that can be mapped and structurally fixed just like pierre hado his critique of science where the persistent gesture is to unveil nature right this is hado's critique of science where science's whole history has been driven by this imperative of unveiling nature nature is a hidden thing and we have to unveil it um, and and other rights and make nature yield her sign uh, yield her secrets right thus ensuring limitless destruction that idea that nature is this hidden thing and science is continually going to unveil that's also the path of continuous relentless exploitation of uh, of nature a limitless destruction but it is also gives little by way of understanding how the world unfolds and actually comes to be uh, to be we also need to steer clear of any possible falling back into the language of identity via the supposed solidity of territory and land in adivasi words rather the promise that land and indigeneity seem to hold here is to alert us to a different way of being where our vulnerabilities to the sovereignty of various forms are also a way of aligning and being being part of continuous emergences as opposed to a fixed idea of land tim ingold would put it this way that there 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 would be it would be more like what it means the difference uh, tim ingold is a anthropologist what he he means the difference is the difference between inhabiting the world as opposed to occupying it right inhabiting as opposed to occupying the sacredness of land here derives not from a given religious code but rather from the ability to compose replicate and assemble a world in an active capacity of openness to multiple forces or the capacity of being vulnerable to another it is this no it is this no wonder that the recognition of adivasi uh, it is because of this no wonder that the recognition of adivasi religion becomes an aporia in the secular world of uh, of multi religious states like india a sacred that cannot be easily coded or monumentalized that only live through the shimmering landscape demanding continuous shifting openness and changes with the land and that only live through the shimmering uh, sorry that and that only live through the shimmering landscape demanding attunement to its emergences as multiple sovereignties is not easily abstract this not only disqualifies adivasi religions as religion in an indian secularism i don't mean to hear the fight between you know secularism pseudo secularism so I, do, i mean broadly i mean including even the ones who will accuse secularism as pseudo secularism as secularism in that way but poses complex problems for strategies of compensation in the context of displacement from the ancestral lands and sacred sites the bongas may be extremely mobile but they are not easily transferred to new settlements created under corporate and state notions of land space and settlement of territory let us listen to one of the greatest adivasi grassroots leaders of our times soma munda who is speaking here generally of the indian modernity's disregard for adivasi religion it is a religion deeply embedded in the land in the territory आ जाए ना
सिर्फ एक ही धर्म रहेगा चाहे हिंदू ही धर्म रहेगा चाहे मुस्लिम ही धर्म रहेगा चाहे ईसाई ही धर्म रहेगा तो ऐसा क्यों उन्होंने संविधान इस तरह का राइट किया है तो इसलिए हम इसलिए आए इसलिए हमारे पास आक्रोश है कि हमारे धर्म को कई करने के लिए कोशिश कराए हम हमारा संबंध है धर्म से जमीन से सनक से शसन से है तो कहे हमारा सनक उठाएगा इसलिए हमारे में आक्रोश है भारत देश एक निरपेक्ष धर्म निरपेक्ष राज्य So Sunita's attachment and attunement to ancestral land cannot be sensed or derived by assuming a belonging based on a physical proximity. Or a, this is a Cartesian relationship to place taken as an enclosure. Rather, in this case, her attachment is a function of a movement of Bonga spirits who act like a medium through which land and people travel attuned to each other. If we take the question of Adivasi or indigenous demand for rights over their lands, we are thus most directly faced with the problem of defining the nature of Adivasi belonging to the land. It is therefore understandable that liberal and critical thought has been overly nervous about paying too much attention to questions of land and belonging. The archive of modernity yields a chain of catastrophe in the connecting of land, belonging, and identity. Nationalism and Nazism is its most, are, are its most general and particular forms. The fear is about an essentializing of roots and seen roots and spatial fixing of human identities as we have in contemporary India or in Israel. It had seemed that the invocation of attachment to land, as in the case of peasant and the indigenous, always comes at the expense of the migratory and the diaspora. Culture, as anthropologists used to say, was sitting too much in place. In the case of the indigenous, even while acknowledging the importance of traditional territory and land, it remained unclear what the status of the non-sedentary, the non-territorial, or the migratory was in that order of things. What is the relationship between the object called land and the person called the Adivasi migrant? How do indigenous claims of belonging actually work in such cases? Place and the migrant's body seem to be utterly important but opposed matters in the anthropology of Adivasi indigeneity. I feel this problem, this problem has some roots in an older Cartesian problem of not having an adequate theory of how bodies interact at a distance. For the Cartesians, which, which in, I'm using it as a very uh, deep foundational text of modern thought, uh, for the Cartesians, for such interactions to happen, one body has to actually be in physical contact with each other. This could take place in an extension of one or both bodies in space. That is, the land has to somehow physically continue and be extended, thus maintaining an uninterrupted contact with the migrant's body. If we propose, in the language of certain kind of nationalisms, some form of fusion of land, territory, and culture tradition, then we get a model, a model however unsatisfactory, of how the migrant body could still be impacted by an ancestral land uh, of one's belonging. But that is precisely the root of the modernist nightmare of nationalisms and fascism. However, to this Cartesian problem, beginning with Newton, we have a series of answers which try to retain the distance between the two bodies and instead evoke We have a series of answers which try to retain the distance between the two bodies and instead evoke a new factor to explain the continuing possibility of impact of one body on another. For Newton, there was the question um, of what he called a milieu. In acting as a vehicle that conveyed the action of one body on another, Newton 
initiated a notion of a medium in which all in which uh, which is always relative to two bodies or centers this relative medium is what newton called a milieu this is the beginning of a complex journey of milieu as a theory of affect across distant bodies to return to the question of land attachment and adivasi person we see now that some kind of a theory of milieu would allow us to circumvent the cartesian problems which deeply underlines our ideas of legal and national uh, notions of land if the object of adivasi land has to have any effective power over the adivasi person something or somehow there has to be a medium or milieu through which this can take place in invoking the sovereignty of the bongas i have introduced the notion of a non human milieu which acts as a continuous intermediary between distinct bodies of the adivasi person and the land or landscape it is because of this mediation mediation that we can actually talk about an intense affective attachment to land of both resident and migratory adivasi bodies without it getting reduced to a language of national essence carried seamlessly in the body in the body of the of the migrant labor the invocation of the centrality of the bongas or and other earth beings as milieu signals another important dimension in the possibility of justice today in the context of a global acceleration of dispossession the adivasi and the indigenous has a particularly important location they are after all both the most extremely dispossessed and the most relentlessly emplaced modern practitioners for whom the materiality of land and the symbolism of human life however can hardly be separated indigeneity is a vivid demonstration of a post colonial form of modernity but without nature without culture in the current age of heightened dispossession it is worth remembering that the crucial question of land has been generically housed in the twin governmentalities of the life of matter which we call the life of matter which we call ecology and the matter of life which we call human rights if it is land as ecology what happens to the equally old and authentic practice of migrant work among adivasis if the it is if it is all about human rights and equality then how does one connect that to the world of land landscape and animal and plant life it is by noticing the centrality of the bongas in adivasi worlds that we see one of the ways one of the ways the minor genre of the non secular that the land and the humans are brought into simultaneous play and attachment i'll just leave it there thank you very much opening new question for this uh, assembly i will put first one question before taking it it's um, the simultaneity and relationship between uh, land human and person i have one question uh, vulnerability of men and women is very diff is sometimes different so you say the vulnerability uh -huh. of men and women being different is this relationship Uh, experience differently. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, no, uh, I think we we'll take the same okay. question. Okay. And, uh, uh, this gentleman. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I, I just wanted to say <clears throat> you talked about the end about Cartesian things, but I hope we have moved away. more much forward from cartesian thing than before because we have a lot of theories of unconscious we have a lot of theory of collective unconscious there have been work done in australia on aboriginal uh, sort of consciousness so i mean we don't need to go back to that and connect cartesian with nationalism and nationalism with nazism and that is that is a blind alley i think we really ought to think much more creatively about uh, what is available in the social sciences and in medicine about these sorts of uh, influence to this gentleman with glasses over there yes hi uh thank you kashyap for your paper uh, i think i need to read it in 
in uh, writing to get it to grasp the arguments completely. But if I have got you uh, right, uh, I like the way you are trying to bring in the uh, migratory body and this. Uh, and the, the impulse to have a sedentarized rootedness together and I think this is very important. Uh, but I was also thinking that uh, while doing this, Bonga's uh, sovereignty is invoked in the moment of crisis when Sunita is not feeling well. Uh, or uh, is it an everyday practice? So I'm trying, in the non-episodic moments, what, is, it, is it the same kind of the sovereignty which is invoked or something else would happen? Just the lady behind Alpa. Uh, thank you for a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. But, but, uh, oh. Excuse me, <laughs> lady behind oh, Alpa. I'm very sure. Just yeah. uh, thank you, Koshik. I really have learned from the talk. I wanted to ask you a question about where you left off. So you're introducing a notion of land which is deterritorialized. What would a model of Adivasi rights? based on that notion of land look like? And I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I know this is where you ended or maybe, but I'm sure you have thoughts on it and I wanted to hear those. Okay. So, yeah? Yeah? Again, thanks for uh, an interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to take the opposite side, how the reactions of Adivasis are are translated in uh, politics and policies. Uh, until recently, what you have described was the, the loss of land, the loss of culture, the loss of identity, was basically answered by pointing out that a development, pro uh, a development process is going on. And the Adivasi should understand that, that what they lost was for the sake of their own development it was shown as a kind of civilizing uh, mission. The jargon has changed. The resistance nowadays in the remaining tribal belt in India is considered to be in political and policy terms anti-national. And they are acting against the national interest. I think that is a very important change in the dialogue. And it is not only the tribals who are resisting their loss of identity, land and culture, it's also seen as a threat to the national interest. And it's not only the tribals who are accountable for what they are resisting, also the ones who are reporting on what are they trying to do are then blamed in the academic community of being anti-national. It's not only the shrinking within the tribal belt, which should be discussed, it's also the shrinking of this kind of information in the academic workplace. Thank you. So you want to uh, yeah. uh, reply? Yeah. I have to take the microphone. Yeah. Mic. Can, you, can you hear me through this? Or? Yeah? yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll try to quickly answer this. These are very complicated and long things. But uh, gender, yeah, absolutely very crucial because, you know, uh, what happens, I mean, just I'll illuminate one side of this uh, question. Uh, what happens is the kind of land laws that uh, historically are applied to Adivasi areas which are very crucial ones. I mean, right now, as we know, in Jharkhand, they're being dismantled. So we are in a, you know, in very, very, uh, almost emergency situation. But at the same time, at the same time, and this is, I'm talking about kind of in a more intellectual terms also, uh, there are so many other processes in which land emerges, right, as an entity. So the land laws, what they've done, is taken one particular aspect of a very patrilineal understanding of land as some kind of property, right? And they have, they have, uh, they, they have, they have uh, attended to that. Whereas land, like including the bongas, is a vastly different kind of process which has nothing to do with patrilineal necessarily. You know, the, the landscape 
the landscape that we are talking about, that these are all non non uh, non kin bongas, right? These have nothing to do. So, and oftentimes it's the women, right, who are accused of having for more relations uh, with such bongas, right? And there's a suspicion always about that. So there are various different kinds of uh, understandings and practices of land which are going on. But I think the very patriarchal, patrilineal form is the one which has been enshrined in law. Uh, I have to no, answer. No, this is There's a question. question. Uh, yeah, about Cartesianism. I didn't. I didn't mean to say Cartesianism as as a, as a way of answering this. But I was just trying to get at the point that certain ideas which come from the Cartesian idea of bodies that remains very strong in the current forms of nationalist imaginations of land, etc. And precisely what we're saying that. There are the kind of imaginations that are coming out of Australian indigenous uh, efforts to affect law in Latin America. That's the kind of direction that I'm trying to push this, right? So it is the, I mean, those are very much uh, post-Cartesian, of course, but I don't think we have actually that situation in India in relation to Adivasis. Um, yeah, the, the question of Bonga non-episodic uh, yeah, that is that is the thing. I mean, we, I have highlighted this episodic manner, but that's what, including that clip that I was showing, what happens is this land, that shimmering land that I'm talking about, even in a non-episodic manner, right? It it's sort of like if you if you are walking on the land, it's not that you are doing worship all the time, but you have to be extremely attentive, right? Who else is present there? And one of the most powerful forces present are the bongas which are in a very everyday non-episodic manner, right? Which is hard for us to understand, who have become, in some sense, receivers of a very political economic idea of what land is, you know? So, and, and it is also quite different, as you could see in the clip, from, say, the Hindu idea of sacred landscape, right? Uh, because the Hindu idea of sacred landscape is very monumental. You know, there's a particular deity, particular temple, and around that is the sacred space. This is not about any monumental space. It's everywhere, right? It's it's a it's an inalienability of that land in some sense. Um, sorry, uh, there was a question of Adivasi rights. I'm forgetting. What was the question? Oh, Kanchan. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a. In some sense, you know, it's both trying to take us beyond the conversation of human rights in the way it goes on, but not necessarily with the idea of that only this thing exists. Human rights exist, and they have their domain, and that is very important. Courts, I mean, legal cases come up, but we cannot limit the, the uh, challenge that Adivasi idea of land brings up, right, uh, in terms of how we are even going to talk about why should they be there, right? And why should they have land, right? And and in some sense, uh, you know, a lot of what I'm, the ecological imperative that I'm talking about, it's kind of a very sad situation where five years ago or something, one would have thought, given that enormous environmental disaster we are hurtling towards, that these kind of imaginations of land become primary discussion in India as opposed to Yogi Adityanath, right? This should have been the future of what we are, is an extreme emergency which affects everybody. And this could have been, as has happened in so many countries now, a completely different constitution has been written around this land question, a completely different kinds of ecological attempts, sometimes naive, sometimes complex, have emerged. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened, right? So when I was writing some of this, I was not thinking so much about the immediate crisis of Adivasi lands, let's say with the uh, effort to dissolve Chattanagpur Tenancy Act or something, but kind of trying to see, okay, why, what was the bigger promise of this? What was it trying to really say to us, other than just legal issues of who owns what, right? Um, I wasn't sure exactly uh, about the development and anti-national because one of the things uh,
very, very crucial, and any archive, uh, including parliamentary debates uh, in India, will show is that continually Adivasis were being suspected of being anti-national. Um, because that, and that is the thing that Banerjee was pointing out at the beginning of the paper, that the idea of autonomy has been central. And the problem of the anti-national position is that it is actually deeply, it itself is the only anti-national in the room. Because it, it basically says, you know, my way, you know, uh, that's it. I'm just going to decide because I'm a majority. That's what it is. It's majoritarian nationalism. And so, so the, the, and I know that that involves, you know, us as academics, we can scream as much as possible. That's a domain of everyday politics and a different kind of uh, practice. But as far as our limited practice here is concerned, uh, it's perfectly clear that it has, it's, it has been always 19th century, 20th century, Adivasi position has been autonom about autonomy. And I think it is a beautiful challenge to a very narrow way of thinking what a nation is, right? In in limited sense, they, they were asking for a federated, a federated system, which which, uh, which which I think is what many groups have asked for. Actually, so I I wouldn't say that anti-national is a you know in that sense is a new thing, right? And but we can we can discuss it further. Do, do we have enough time? No, I'm sorry, but I think, no, but you can continue the discussion afterwards. Eh? Thank you very much, and let us say uh, thanks uh, for a very stimulating lecture. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. Thank you, our chairperson. We have two parallel technical sessions now. Social justice and governance challenges in Cotillia Hall and political dynamics and development agenda in Nalanda Hall on the fifth floor. We will meet again in this hall after the technical sessions.